despite the uh, rail problems. So thank you very much. Uh, we're very lucky tonight to have Rob uh, with us. He is a master inventor for IBM. Yeah. Uh, 50 patents, or has everyone asked since? Uh, it's about, yeah, yeah. about 50 issued patents at the moment, yeah. Cool. And uh, 25 years of IBM currently doing hybrid cloud technology? Yeah. Yeah, so I uh, lead uh, the basically the worldwide engineering team uh, building what IBM calls um, integration. Um, so uh, uh, if that may mean something to you, and we'll, we'll calibrate to what extent uh, that means something to you during the, during the talk, and I'll uh, try and uh, adjust the pitch of the talk to, uh, to the yeah, integration technology. Brilliant. Uh, just one note, we do have the AGM afterwards. Uh, it'll only be 10 minutes, so please hang around. And we've got a few degrees after that if there's any incentives to stay. <laughs> Thanks very much. No problem. So, um, as I said, so uh, my name's Will Nicholson. Um, I'm, a, I'm an engineer. I uh, work at the uh, Hursley Laboratories down near Winchester. Um, and I, I have the privilege to lead uh, basically a, you know, a large engineering team that build the integration technology that you know, most most of IBM's clients, in fact, most of the major banks and healthcare companies, uh, industrial companies in the, in the world rely on to connect things up. Um, it's I have to say it's a it's a, it's a really my job is the most fascinating job you can imagine. I get to walk into um, all these different companies and talk to the chief technology officers about their challenges and about how they need to use technology to transform their business. Um, and I have to say, I was saying you know, uh, over coffee, um, now is a really good time to be a geek. I assume most of us here are geeks. Uh, I'm certainly a, a fully paid up geek. Um, because the world is changing so fast at the moment. It's this thing that you know, the, the business folks call digital transformation. Um, it's a, a radical shift in how you generate value, how enterprises generate value, um, and it's underpinned by technology. And, and, and as a geek um, walking into these companies, trying to, you know, who's all trying to figure out their personal you know, journey through through that transformation, um, it's, yeah, it's a, as I say, it's a fascinating job. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you. I've got some slides. Uh, they're adjusted from slides that I give to kind of enterprise audiences. Um, I talk to customers. Um, I'm going to use them as a basis, but really, you know, let's make this a conversation. I'm, I'm, I need feedback from you. I need to calibrate to what extent what I'm saying is making sense. So if it's not making sense, interrupt, and, and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll take it from there. I'm going to talk to you about you know, my area, hybrid integration, and how that underpins this, this transformation that, that's occurring in the world, this digital transformation. Uh, IBM makes me put these disclaimers in there just about trademarks and, and, and things like that. It shouldn't, shouldn't matter too much, but I have to have them in here. So when I talk about digital transformation, what, what is it? Why is it important? What is hybrid integration um, and you know, how is that changing? Um, and then I'm going to start to get into how most of the enterprises that I go out and I talk to are using um, integration to power that transformation of yeah. companies, the architectures they're getting into. And we can go deep or we can stay high, and that will depend on, on, on you. Um, at the end, I'll kind of make it real. I'm, this is, you know, so obviously when I talk normally, I'm talking on behalf of IBM trying to fundamentally sell products. Um, or, or help customers to understand how to use our products. I'm going to just maybe just talk a little bit about some of the products at the end, just kind of to illustrate it, to make it real and concrete, um, if we need to. So, um, yeah, digital transformation. Uh, the best way I can describe this, you think about Uber. Right? Uber is now the world's largest taxi company. Right? It, it, it's worth um, you know, uh, certainly more than a billion. I can't remember the end. So it's a it's a it's a it's a billion dollar company. It doesn't own any taxis. Uber was founded by a bunch of geeks who had an idea and they built a technology platform. And they have displaced or are displacing real companies that have been incumbent for years in the world. Uh, and you know, if you were five years ago, you were you know, you know the owner of a taxi company, maybe in London or or in San Francisco, or, or um, you know, in Bangalore, you wouldn't have thought that you were competing with a bunch of geeks in California. 
Right? They would never have crossed your mind. But actually, you are, and that's digital transformation. Um, you know, the same goes for Facebook. You know, Facebook is the most popular um, you know, media platform. It doesn't create any media. Um, Airbnb is doing the same in, in, in hotels. So this is a very radical transformation that's happening in the world. Um, and you know, the startups are all trying, they're all there trying to disrupt uh, the incumbents. Most of, you know, so I'm from IBM, most of our customers are the incumbents. So they're engaged in the same, the same trick. They're engaged in trying to, to not be disrupted and to disrupt their, their competitors using the same, the same, uh, the same kind of digital, you know, digital transformation, playing the same, playing the same games. Um, so all the organisations I've talked to are, are looking to, um, to find a way to unlock value from their existing IT. So these are you know, mostly existing companies. I do talk to a few startups, but, but mostly I'm talking to existing enterprises. Actually, let me just calibrate. Hands up anyone in the room who either does currently or, 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 or used to work for a kind of an enterprise. Okay, so about half the room. So the rest of you, academia, startups? NHS. Oh, uh, okay. 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 Good. Okay, so I try not to trip over that. Um, you, most of these enterprises are trying to find a way to expose you know, APIs um, to developers. Now these developers might be inside the company or they might be outside of the, the company, could be either, um, to develop applications to generate, essentially generate value. This is kind of a, a very, very, very high level. This is the trick, right? You, you expose your existing IT infrastructure as APIs to developers either inside or outside of the company you develop some kind of a, a new interaction pattern and you use that to generate new value. Um, let me skip through that. So that's just a very quick introduction to what I'm on about with digital transformation. Um, let me kind of bridge now to what is, what is integration and, um, and how, does that relate to, um, how does that relate to hybrid, uh, to digital transformation. So, I am not sure that this slide is going to be readable from the back, is it? Okay, so what, <coughs> let me calibrate. Hands up anyone who kind of know, thinks they know what an integration product is, or has used one. Okay, so it's less than half, okay. So when I talk about integration, what I'm talking about are the software products that people use to join together IT systems. That's, that's at a very high level. So uh, that ranges from you know, the enterprise service bus, um, from, from kind of service-oriented architecture. Um, it ranges from pieces of, of you know, snippets of Java code that get used to, to connect to some software as a service or some piece, of, some piece of, uh, of, of physical technology. So I'm talking about the glue that glues together information systems. That's what, that's what I do, that's what my team does. Um, that's what you know, you know, many, many of the big IT companies spend a lot of their time doing. And, and typically, that, those integrations are important because it's kind of as you connect one thing to another that you can generate value. And especially now, at the time of this digital transformation, it's, it's taking the things that you have, the information that you have, and finding a way to generate more value from that information and expose it to customers. So maybe you have, you maybe have information about, about your customers or your users, you can join that with some information that somebody else has, and the, and the sum of the parts is, is, uh, is, yeah, it generates, generates some value. So the kinds of interaction, I'm gonna end up kind of reading the slide because, um, because you probably can't see it from, from, from the back. The kinds of things that people are doing are the event action pattern. When this thing happens, do this other thing. Um, the creation of, of APIs, so where you have um, a, 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 an, external, an external API that someone can call that then causes a, a bunch of internal 
um, you know, back-end systems to get invoked and results in a, in a reply. So by an API, um, let me just try and make this, this real, um, you know, all of the major um, uh, cloud companies expose APIs from, so Google exposes APIs, Facebook exposes APIs, and, and this is the way that people interact and build new integrations with those, those cloud platforms. All of my customers are trying to do the same thing. I mean, banks are trying to do it, every retailer is trying to do it, to expose APIs to allow developers, either inside their company or outside of their company, to interact with their enterprise. Um, we see data copying. Um, so those of you who've worked deeply in uh, IT for, for, uh, for, for a while probably recognize um, data copy, data replication and synchronization as, to some extent, anti-patterns. Um, However, most, yeah, so, yeah, so see people see that, and, oh, why, why are you so concerned about doing data copy and data replication? It still happens um, in, every, in every enterprise. Vast amounts of data gets copied from one place to another and replicated between systems, either one way or two way or n way. And part, you know, one of the reasons that that is happening now, I'll say now before I, before I forget to mention it, is um, many, of these existing companies built their IT systems in the days of green screens and you know, maybe they had a web portal. Um, and now, those same IT systems are being used to power mobile devices. Right? And with a mobile device, people check their bank balance all the time. Right? So rather than you going to the bank or to the cash point to check your bank balance or maybe going home to log onto your computer, Right? No, you just put out. Has that, that payment gone in yet? You think what that does to the back end systems that were expecting you know, 100 transactions a minute, right? and now they're getting 10,000 transactions a second because everybody's taking the bank balance or doing, interacting with mobiles. So, so, one of the reasons that data copy is occurring is literally just creating caches. So, um, the, mobile, the mobile app, the back end for that mobile app, probably is not actually checking your real bank balance. It's probably checking a copy that was made you know, every half an hour. So you can keep checking it, but it isn't going to update because it's half an hour. It's a, it's a cache that gets updated every half an hour. That's a very common pattern that we see that people dealing with the, uh, the scale of, of these mobile devices. Um, so, Rob, isn't it true that you might think, even if you think that Copying data is somehow doing something redundant. Mm -hmm. In actual fact, it's enabling parallelism. Yeah, that's, and that's true. One yeah. traditional challenge is how to get parallelism. And you know, all the traditional ways of trying to parallelize things don't work terribly well, terribly well other yeah. than copying data. Yeah, that, that's true. So, so copying data um, to create powers and, and, and copying data from a, for example, from a relational database, which probably can't exploit parallelism very well because it's designed to do ACID transactions, into um, uh, you know, a, a, a Duke cluster or into Spark, where you can apply uh, massive parallel computation against it to generate insight. And so that's a very, again, it's a very common pattern. Um, so, and, and this is, you know, this is a very uh, important part of digital transformation. Um, Let's take this data that we've got and let's figure out how we can make the most uh, use of it. So if you think about LinkedIn, for example, LinkedIn are a company, the only thing they, the only thing they have is data that they've got from, from clients. They generate all their value just by processing that, 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 that data and finding a way to extract something useful from that, from that data. So yeah, parallelism is very, very, very important. Can I just follow on from that, please? Are you basically comparing the cost of storage with the cost of processing on either time or money terms? And how do you define value in the first place? Is it only financial? Well, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, I, I, I wasn't trying to... Uh, so, so, finance, so value comes in very various forms. Um, so for many of my clients, um, value is financial. So, you know, LinkedIn, they're trying to... Fundamentally, they're trying to generate they're trying to generate money. Um, but obviously, you know, I work with healthcare companies, so value also comes in other forms. You know, figuring out 
the, the particular patients have got you know, susceptibility to a particular disease and, and informing them that's value too. So, it's, uh, but I'm using it as a generic term. It, uh, I think it's to generate something that somebody wants. Now, often that, oftentimes that ends up in a, in a monetary transaction, even in the healthcare, particularly in the US, it ends up as a, a monetary transaction. But, um, but yeah, it's just generating value, generating something useful. Um, Google uses quite a bit of data, copy not they? They certainly do. Yes. So Google invented a lot of the technology that you know the world uses to do. Um, to, you know, to, to do this value creation um, and, and you know, open source it, it gets shared around and, and uh, you know, all, you know, all, the, all the IT companies contribute to it. But yeah, absolutely, Google, one of the pioneers of, of, um, of the massive, massive scalability. So, in integration, um, those of you, some of you I, I know, I've, I've spoke to you before, beforehand, um, have, a, have a background in kind of traditional integration, traditional integration, integration products. Um, uh, it's changing, and it's changing really, really fast. So in, if, if you go back five years, you can probably tell I've been around, um, I've been writing for 25 years. If you go back five years, the folks I would have talked to um, would have mostly worked in the IT organization. They would have been professional IT people, and they would have been building integration using proper integration products, you know, sorts of things that IBM produces. Um, these days, those people still exist, and, um, and I still talk to them, but what we also find are um, folks working in the lines of business who are doing integration. So th this kind of concept of IT being locked up into the kind of the special IT group who work down in the, kind of in the back room, that is changing fast, even in the banks. Now the banks are probably the last, um, the, you know, the last bastion of, of, of this. Uh, the very strong architectural control, but, but, but even in the banks, we're finding that um, a lot of the integration is just happening in the lines of business. People are you know, getting access to, to data, requiring access to data, and they want tools that are usable by mere mortals, that are much, you know, much dramatically easier to use. Um, hybrid, so, uh, and I'll come on to talk about all of these things in, in a moment. Um, everything's moving to the cloud, um, on-premise systems are moving to the cloud, and more and more uh, of my customers are making use of particular, almost like niche providers of software as a service. <coughs> so, um, for example, I was talking to um, uh, somebody from a financial company uh, last week, and they they had previously been responsible. They were in the IT company, IT organisation. They'd been responsible for a whole bunch of applications that, that interacted with their Oracle database which used, uh, which was used for customer relationship management. And they just outsourced all of that, they now use Salesforce. So now all of those applications that previously talked to a database, they've now got to be integrated with Salesforce, which is a software as a service um, customer relationship management you know, thing. So, so there's many tens of applications that need to you know, kind of be integrated. So moving to hybrid, uh, and then, obviously, the digital transformation and the API economy, which I'm going to come on to talk about. So, um, as, you know, as I said, when I, you know, previously, when I would have gone uh, out and talked to customers, I would have seen, I would have been speaking to these central IT folks, uh, very skilled, uh, very skilled in integration. This is their job. They're, 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 uh, um, they're full-time, uh, you know, Core. They've been doing it for 10 years. That's all they know. But I'm finding now that the, you know, within the lines of business, there are people, technical people, who are semi-technical. So they, they probably can program, but they prefer not to. So these are, these are the kind of the, the folks who use you know, spreadsheets. Maybe use use VBA and, and you know, use use the scripting within within spreadsheets. Um, and they, they want tools to do integration that are much, much, much easier to use. And there's certainly a prevalence, you know, on the right hand side here, for those of you who can read the slide, at the top we talk about cloud connectivity, um, uh, you know, the, the ability to actually run uh, the integration on the, on the cloud, uh, and then we come down into on premise. So, central IT is using everything. These folks are very much in, in the cloud. And then we come across to, um, to people who are really non-technical, so marketing people. 
And we are finding, in many of our customers, we've got marketing people, people who have absolutely no technical knowledge at all, who are doing integration. And then they're using tools that look a bit like, um, say, if this, then that. And, uh, uh, is anyone, hands up anyone who's you or knows about what if this, then that is. Okay, about half. So these are, it's very simple. Um, if this thing happens, if Tesco has a wine, uh, has an offer on my favorite wine, then send me an SMS. Or if I leave this area in my car, then send my, send my wife an email to say I've lost work, uh, left work. Um, so those kind of technologies are being used within the, you know, within enterprises to do, to do integration. It's a real radical shift. And I can tell you that these guys, these central IT guys, are, are mighty upset by this. Um, th th there's a real kind of war going on in many, in many enterprises between the, the people who really think that they know how it should be done and the people are actually doing you know, integration uh, and getting it wrong and causing all sorts of problems but, but achieving value for the, for the business as, as they go. Um, so is it part of the hack that they Persons don't know enough about the business. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and the people that know the business don't know the exactly. technology. Yeah. It's exactly. The same. So the role of hybrid therefore is to bring them all. Yeah. So that's yeah. That and so that, thank you. That's kind of one of the points I'm leading up to is um, it's all very well for the propeller heads you know, like me, like maybe some of us. Uh, down in the bowels of, of, the, uh, of the computer room to know all about integration. But we're slow. You know, so we have to get a change request. And, and, and then it has to be processed and stamped in triplicate and analyzed and we have to build an architecture and reviews and we have to check whether the, the architectural governance rules are all being met. Meanwhile, three months later, the user, the line of business, is trying to run a marketing campaign it's kind of got bored, right? And, 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 and so we I mean, have this big um, uh, challenge that the, 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 the lines of business want to have an idea. Well, let's run a marketing campaign. It's going to be a bit like this. Well, let's have a new product. Let's have a new mobile app. And they want it done like next week. Not, not in three months' time or six months' time or nine months' time, which is what traditional IT will typically need to get that done. And that's, that's exactly why we're seeing the lines of business take over. Because now, with some of the tooling that's becoming available, that, that is possible. You know, it is possible, and we're going to you know, talk about how it's possible for the lines of business people to actually you know, do some of the IT, uh, IT integrations. Ross, well, about 10 years ago, which is where my memory takes me back, uh, there was a lot of stress on choreography languages, mm -hmm. various languages. So came out. Mm -hmm. What's happened to that? Um, now, you're recording me, so I need to be polite. Um, a, a, a lot of that stuff has been successful in niches. There are plenty of our customers who are being successful with that. Um, the world's moved on, though, um, to um, developers who just get the job done the quickest way they possibly can without any kind of well, architectural governance. The, the, the world has moved on to just fix it now. Do it, do it by the end of the week. That's the, that's the mantra now in the organization. So a lot of that technology which was kind of architecturally interesting has kind of fallen by the, by the wayside. That's, that's what's really happened. So many of our customers have built service-oriented architectures. We, you know, for, many, for a long time, IBM preached service-oriented architecture. It's a very good idea, and many of our customers have been successful with it. But the reputation that service-oriented architecture has now in the, in, the, in the industry is it's slow, and it's a cost center, it's not a profit center, and you know, well, we don't really need that anymore. We're just going to move, move fast. Um, some, you know, some, yeah, there's, there's people kind of nodding and shaking their heads here. There are companies that have been very successful. The companies that did it right have been very successful with it. But there's a lot of customers, a lot of, a lot of companies that, that didn't do it right or, or didn't have enough investment and, and, and you know, it's, it's got itself a bad, a bad name. The, 
the, the conversations I have now are about digital and about speed. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's moved on. Um, so hybrid, um, just very quickly, um, building integrations in the cloud, in either in, uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, or as I say, using software as a service tools, Salesforce being a great example that people will probably recognize. Um, every enterprise needs to be able to connect between on-prem, all the different clouds, all the different software as a service providers and do that in the same way. So the example I quoted of the, you know, the, the enterprise is just outsourced all their CRM to, to, uh, to, uh, to Salesforce. Um, but all those apps that need access to the CRM, they still all need to be connected in. Um, and uh, you know, various different styles of integration, APIs we talked about, data, copy we talked about, uh, and also this kind of concept of, a, of event action integration. So all of these uh, are styles that, that come up. So let me talk about how uh, integration actually enables uh, um, the, the digital transformation. Um, so what the, the company is trying to do, most of our, you know, almost every one of my, my customers, is trying to you know, build awesome mobile apps, enable APIs that, um, that, that, that enable partners and third-party developers to interact um, with the enterprise. And, and this is it's even true. You know, I was talking to a, um, I can't say the company name, but I was talking to a, a retailer, a major high street food and clothing retailer this week um, about their APIs. And, and they, they publish APIs to allow other people to build applications that sit on top of their platform because they think that that will mean that people will come into their stores, physical stores, and buy food. And, they, and they, you know, we, we talked about it, and, and, and they're right. The, 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 the ideas that they have will, will almost certainly work. And they're building APIs to enable apps on top of their platform to, not to drive digital sales, but actually to drive people to come into their stores and buy stuff, physical stuff. It's quite, quite, quite interesting um, that that would work, yeah, but I think it, I think it does. Um, and to refactor the, uh, the organisation to move fast and be able to innovate. So in order to, to do that, um, uh, many, of the, many of my customers are trying to you know, sort of modernise their 50-year-old uh, applicable. In some cases, 50-year-old applications. In many cases, 30-year-old applications. Um, and like we were talking about just now, enable the business users to actually get things done quickly. So, um, in order to do all of that, we need to unlock the system's record, synchronise with them, and embrace, you can't, sorry, you can't read this on a projector, embrace external sources of information. So, connect out to all these, you know, these software as a service applications. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this because we talked about this. So, this is a very uh, important slide. I've kind of hinted at this before. Um, in almost every one of the companies I go to, we have this multi modal IT concept. We have enterprise IT teams who've been there forever. Um, they're the experts, they're the custodians of the systems of record. They're important because they maintain the systems that actually make the company run. They that, that run the payroll, that, that process the, the sales transactions, that process the bank accounts, etc. Um, they are charged with keeping those systems you know, sane, sensible, continuing to run online, never getting corrupted. They're, they're very, very, yeah, they're very, very important to the business. And yet, they are getting cut hard because they're seen as a cost centre, and the investment is going into these digital teams. And the digital teams are mostly, in many cases, they're very young, straight out of, out of college. They're, in most cases, they do not report to the CIO. They often report to the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer. Or maybe they're sponsored directly by the CEO. And, and this, uh, you, you see this happening. You know, or, or, or sometimes they're, they're, they're employed by the CTO, the Chief Technology Officer. But they're sponsored at a high level, and they are told, solve the problem, transform this company, make it relevant in the age of Uber, in the age of Airbnb. I don't care how you do it. 
We're not going to have any architectural guidelines. Right? We're, we're not going to have any rules. The only thing you need to do is you need to solve this problem and do it by the end of the week. Right? So I don't care. You can use PHP, you can use Node.js, you can use Java, you can use Scala. I don't care what you use. Just get the job done. Um, and by the way, if these guys give you any trouble, you send them to me and, and make them give, give you access to the systems that you need. So if you're building a digital application and you need access to one of the, the traditional on-prem enterprise IT applications that keeps the business running, they need to give you access, and if they won't give you access, send you know, send them to the CTO and then let them. Yeah. And I mean, we see this actually playing out in, in, in many companies. Um, I'm being overly dramatic here about this, so, uh, but, uh, but there are certainly customers of mine where these two teams are at war with each other and hate each other. There are other co companies where there's a, a really good blend between them, and, and it, it just depends. My role. Um, and our role uh, within integration is to, is to enable both because it turns out that for a, a large enterprise to be successful with a digital transformation, you absolutely do need those guys, the digital guys who are going at breakneck speed, um, you know, innovating, making mistakes, creating new ideas. And you need the enterprise IT to keep the system, keep the lights on, and keep keep the system sane, and do it more and more and more efficiently. And you need the two to talk to each other in a safe and controlled way. So this is the diagram that I have crystallised out from you know, hundreds, or say I, uh, you know, myself and my colleagues have, have crystallised out from um, many many conversations with uh, with many organisations. As a, as a kind of a, it's like a, a reference architecture for digital business. Um, it's a complicated diagram, I'm going to you know, kind of go through it. The point of this diagram is that it, it reflects how many of the successful companies, the companies that have done this successfully, have actually achieved that. Um, that interaction between the digital and the, and the, and the, um, the enterprise IT organisations and done it in the same, the same way. Um, so it starts with the, the digital front door. So, and this is really, in, in most cases, this is what we're trying to enable. So we're trying to build mobile applications, we're trying to enable partners. We're trying to have, uh, you know, participate in the API economy. We're trying to, in, you know, interact with Internet of Things um, and interact with, with software as a service offerings. The, the, the external boundary to the company will usually be an API event gateway. So that's a product. IBM has one. I, you know, the, the name of IBM's one is API Connect. You used to be called API, IBM API Management. I'm not going to sell you that. There, there, are, there are plenty of other companies as well that have these things. The point of that product is that it, it provides these developers and partners with a way to consume APIs. Um, so, you know, if you go to, um, I'll, pick any, I'll pick an example, if you go to Amazon um, and you're a developer, um, you sign into the Amazon console and you, and you, you, have, an, you have an identifier and um, yeah, you, can, you can sign up to use various of the APIs, you can be charged for the use of those APIs in some cases, um, uh, you can renew your credentials, you can interact with, with, with Amazon via those, via those APIs. Um, you can find out about the APIs. So if one of the, you know, every one of the enterprises needs that capability and the API event gateway gives them that. It also gives them um, the ability to uh, to, to, to control those APIs, to, to, to say, well, this developer has been behaving badly, we're going to them out, or we're going to rate them in them, or we're only going to give them access to certain things. Um, it allows us to, to have analytics. So it's kind of a, you know, the digital front door, if you like, of the, of the company. Um, is, that, is that making sense? Yeah, If we take the Amazon example, just yeah. refer, presumably the Amazon partners use these services. Yeah. Can you? Say a few more words about that. Um, what services they might use? Well, so if you think, I mean, so the, uh, 
we we'll use Amazon. Really so. Amazon Web Services, for example, which be a be a, um, so Amazon have uh, a whole platform, a whole cloud platform. Yeah. Yeah. So I use it. Um, so person, I use it in my personal life. I should probably not say that really. I should probably say I use the IBM one, but I do. I use the I use the Amazon one, and I store all my photographs there. So I've I've written some code. That, 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 that gets um, that, 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 that essentially copies my photographs from my from my laptop and, and stores them in uh, in in Glacier, which is one of their one of their services, and it uses APIs to do that. So I have a developer key um, which I got from the, from the Amazon uh, platform, and um, that that developer key gives me access to the APIs and allows them to know who I am and to limit limit, limit me in charge. So you know, there's a there's an example. Um, uh, pick another example. Uh, uh, if I'm uh, if I'm Amazon retail and I'm I'm building an app, I'm building an app. I'm sure. I think I'm pretty sure that I can I can actually buy a book. Right? I can actually you know, interact with an API that will allow me to buy a book. So you know, every you know, every one of the enterprises needs APIs to interact with uh, you know, and, you know, with interact to interact with their enterprise. Um, so if I'm a clothes retailer, I might have an API which will list me all of the, the clothing, uh, the clothing that's available. Maybe buy it, or maybe just just know about it. Um, so it's those those sorts of things. Okay, makes sense. Okay. So uh, moving on down. The, the next layer down, I, I've called the, the systems of engagement and business logic. So this is really the domain, in many cases, the domain of the, uh, of, of the digital teams. And yeah. so there's a new style of architecture that we find uh, many times in, the, in this space called microservice architecture. So let me just calibrate. Because if I'm going to explain microservice architecture, everyone knows with it. So hands up, hands up if you're reasonably proficient in microservice architecture. Okay, so less about less than a quarter. So we'll go through microservice architecture. Microservice architecture is a new architectural, or fairly new architectural style, which is well suited to um, to these kind of teams that move very, very fast. Um, now, in the past. People build applications, and, then, and people object to this slide, by the way. So, so in the past, people built monolithic applications, and of course, everyone in the audience is saying, "No, we didn't. We we componentized our applications, and we and we and we used and we used you know, service-oriented architectures, or we, um, and we and we certainly you know, deployed them, and we thought very hard about the architectures of our applications. Um, they weren't they weren't monoliths, but what I mean by a monolith is um, and what the industry means by monolith is, is these applications uh, were built typically to run on an app server, right? So in many cases, you know, the canonical one would be would be Java Enterprise Edition, JEE or Spring, and they were designed. They, they all used Java. They used the same programming language. There were standards about how it was done. Um, they probably ran together, even though the application was componentized. It probably ran together in a single app server or in a farm of app servers. And it probably had a very well-defined data access layer, and everybody used the same data access layer. It was very controlled, um, and that was a that was and still is a great way to build applications. But what it doesn't enable is a bunch of new grads from, or not even grads, you know, school leavers who are all wizard programmers in various different uh, techniques who've. Who've, who've, who've just been to a, a conference and learned the latest graph database that's just awesome and can solve the problem yeah, that, 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 that previously you would have spent you know, 10 person years building vast amounts of Java code, but instead of that you could just use a graph database and you've solved the problem. But it, didn't, it doesn't enable those people to be as productive as they can be perhaps using a microservice application. So, Let's be clear, this is a style for building applications. Um, this is not so much about service-oriented architecture, which is kind of about decomposing the, the, the enterprise. This is about building um, um, an, an application. And, and the point is that each of this application is built from what you might call, a, what you might call components. 
but they, they are separate running services. So, sorry, is there a question? Well, I mean, it's more of a comment. I, I mean, one thing that I, I consider rather unsolved with this microservices idea is, is in fact, I mean, what Jeff has said about the orchestration, because, I mean, you've got a ton of microservices, but when someone has to make certain that they all play together in a way that, well, I mean, does something reasonably at the end of the day, which mm -hmm. becomes increasingly difficult, I yeah. think. Yeah, but, yeah. That's true. Yeah. So, so, um, so the way that you think about software development has to change radically when you build microservice architecture, really radically. I mean, so I it's a rediscovery really, I mean, of, of certain aspects of modularization and but the, the idea that's often mentioned in the context of microservices that, 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 that you have these small agile teams and each mm -hmm. of these teams is responsible for their so, own yeah. microservice but then well, I mean, someone has to have some sort of way to orchestrate the whole thing or else yeah, I mean, they, they may all work perfectly well but then uh, the whole uh, doesn't make any sense anymore. Right. So um, these are all very good points, uh, and they are dangers of microservice architecture. And yet, um, you know, it's it's also it's true that there's a bunch of companies who have been incredibly successful with microservice architectures. You know, LinkedIn. Um, you know, created the whole company around you know, uh, microservice architecture. Netflix. You know, transform their architectures and so 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 it's not to disagree with you at all you're absolutely right there are a bunch of issues to solve but it can be successful and many of I you know, I'll tell you many of the big companies big enterprises around the world most of the banks uh, most of the healthcare companies have got teams building this kind of application using microservice architecture you, you just need to retrain the application programs you do. instead of thinking in uh, and centric way you need to think of stateless and workflow exactly. and data flow. It's still hard though. It's I mean everything hard. that this gentleman said is true. Yes. Completely true. It's hard. But then there's a bunch of hard problems here too. Okay? Right? <laughs> a bunch of hard problems. How do you how do you so, so by the way I've got a team in Hursley, um, uh, a big team, um, who are building one of the products I might talk about later if we have time. And we're using a microservice architecture, so we're living it right now. Um, and we're living a lot of the problems that you described, uh, and we're living a lot of the solutions that, 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 that we you know, can talk about around this. So, um, so anyway, so Microsoft's architecture, each of these, each of these components um, has to you know, live, you know, it, 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 it has to be stood up on its own separately with a well-defined interface, it scales separately, it's deployed separately, can be updated separately. Um, that gives you a lot more agility. And it gives you a lot more problems as well. So, um, so you know, in a microservice architecture, each of those services is, is small. Uh, and we'll, remember, we're building a single app here. Um, each of those components can individually scale separately, and that's important in a cloud scale architecture. If we think about what we're actually trying to do here. We're trying to enable mobile apps from tens of thousands or millions of, of users. You need to be able to scale horizontally. Um, uh, the fact that each of those services is decoupled, or should be decoupled, should allow you to do faster iteration cycles. But, but then you run into the problems that this gentleman talked about. So then you have to have things like contract tests. So where a contract test, I'm going to go off at a tangent here, but, 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 but it was raised, so, so I'll, I'll mention it. A contract test is where um, if I'm consuming your service, uh, um, I will give you a test to run that I've written Every time you change your service, you have to run my test, not your test. You, can write, you need to write all your tests as well. You have to write my test because my test describes the things that I depend upon from your service, and you might not know what those are, right? So that enables that enables you to change your app. So if you change your app and it doesn't break my test and it breaks my app, that's my fault. My test wasn't good enough. I should have given you a better contract test. Right? So now we learn, right? So there's, there's a bunch of things, just one little example of how you can, how you can solve those kinds of problems. Um, so, um, yeah, they give you potentially reduced dependencies and, 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 and the ability to, to fail. Um, so rather, fail fast means um, exactly that. So um, today, one of my developers will make a change, 
it will they'll they'll they'll, they'll put it in and run in the integration tests and it will fail quickly. And, and we can know that by the end of the day, and then we can fix it tomorrow, as opposed to waiting for a three-week deployment uh, a deployment cycle, which you might have to do in a, in a kind of long way. So, let's go faster. Right. So, yeah, using IBM technology, um, I, I took off, off a lot of the acronyms here, so to change the charts. But so, so yeah, we would use and probably used, you know, WebSphere, ND. Uh, a Java EE server coupled to DB2 for my life. That would have been the IBM way of doing that. Or, or, or maybe kits, yeah. uh, or, or one of the others. But that, that would have been the model. Now, what people will be doing is you know, maybe a Node.js app with a, 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 a NoSQL database called MongoDB. And then another one here, you know, uh, also with uh, Node.js, and then maybe a, a Web Liberty Java Enterprise Edition server connected to a different uh, NoSQL database. So you, so you notice that the storage is separate as well, and that's important. So rather than everyone using the same database, they all figure out what storage they need for themselves. They interact, so this is kind of as we get into the integration challenge here, mostly point-to-point -point HTTP connections. So there's no orchestration. Right? They're literally point-to-point -point connections. Or asynchronous, simple asynchronous messaging. So um, yeah, we use uh, something called Apache Kafka, which is a uh, well-known message message bus, high, very highly scalable, invented by LinkedIn, by the way, um, uh, to do that. But there are obviously other technologies. But the focus is very much on building the intelligence into the endpoints and not into the, the glue between them. So that's a real turnaround from the kind of days of the of the enterprise service bus, where the focus was on putting smarts in the connection. Very much in microservice architecture, the focus is on putting the smarts actually out in the applications and just using simple REST uh, and simple asynchronous messaging. Um, so, in fact, that's pretty much what this slide says. Um, so, lightweight messaging, so AMPP is another example, advanced message queuing protocol, um, pubs up uh, eventual consistency as opposed to passive transactions. Um, so some of the some of the other things that, as we get into talking about microservice architecture, um, one of the things that's very important is this concept of a circuit breaker pattern, um, which is very briefly, it's kind of, you know, as it was brought up, one of the other things that can happen is if one of these microservices is having a problem, um, best practice is to think about well what would happen, what would happen say in this microservice if this microservice here is having a problem. Is there something I can do um, to not call it, to, 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 or to fail, fail quickly? So rather than every one of my thousands of, you know, thousands of transactions a second all failing, maybe I'll just you know, send, one, send one in a thousand transactions through. If it fails, I'll just fail the next thousand transactions straight away, because I know they're probably going to fail as well, rather than sending all the, all, all the transactions through. So new patterns of interaction that come up. So, okay. So in this in this architecture that, that, that you know, I'm finding many of the clients use, we talked about the external event gateway. We talked about the fact that, that here many times people are using microservice architecture. You don't have to, but many times um, people are using microservice architecture. I, I want us to talk about this second event gateway because. Um, because it's very, very, very important. In fact, it's probably the most important thing on the slide. The same, the same technology that we use up here for the external gateway can be used between the uh, system, the system APIs that probably come from the IT department, from the you know, run the business, from the guys that we've always talked to. Um, at, and, and you know, to enable the, the guys up here, which is probably the digital teams, to, to innovate and go fast. And it's, quite, it's quite, quite interesting that almost all of the same problems that you might want to solve uh, on the boundary of your enterprise, you can solve, you, you need to solve those, almost those same problems um, here in the center of the, of the enterprise. So, um, many, many folks now are building 
um, building a second layer. And they're saying to these digital teams, if, if you want to interact with the systems of record, you better go to the API gateway and you better go get an API from the catalog and you better go get a, um, <coughs> you know, a credential and an account just exactly the same way if you were outside of the company, right? And we'll be able to rate them at you, we'll be able to turn you off just the same way. So basically, we, we, these folks down here don't trust these folks, right? Because they might make mistakes. Just the same way that these folks here don't really trust these folks. So, so you get your trust by putting in some strong control. And it's exactly the same strong control you want to put there. And this is this kind of concept of having these two layers of, of, um, of APIs, of API and then gateways, is kind of what allows the digital teams and the, and the IT, you know, central IT teams to kind of fall back in love with each other. Um, because it gives, it gives these, these folks what they need, which is the speed and agility to get APIs and to provision them, and it gives these guys down here the control that they need. So, um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this box. This, this box here is your traditional integration. Um, so this is where you'd find probably the enterprise service bus. Well, you know, so as I say, so is not something that people talk about so much now, but, but, but this is where you'd find the enterprise service bus. And this is where you'd find teams of people building quite complex, um, quite, um, quite profound integrations that understand that these systems of record are probably transactional. So um, as we bridge between an API uh, that, these, that these folks use, which is, which is clearly not going to be transactional, down to a you know, transactional system of record, the, the, the kind of tools, the kind of integration tools that you use here are the more, um, you know, the more kind of IT-centric, more skill-centric tools for doing those transformations. Transforming from maybe yeah, you know, 20 year old data formats um, or, or you know, cobalt copy books are probably more like 40, 40 year old um, data formats which exist in many of our older customers um, into what these guys want which is possibly XML but almost uh, in, in many cases now JavaScript object, object notation, JSON, that's what they want. So, so is that the kind of level of, transit, um, of integration that's occurring here to build these APIs that can, that can, be, that can be composed? Is that, I mean, so, questions that is this making sense? Is this, does it resonate? Do you disagree? I've got a, I've got a question. Yeah. Your previous slide showed service discovery in yeah. the second uh, microservices layer, and I just wondered how, I mean, the, the, these adjacent services, are they web services or they could be anything? Yeah. So, so, is, is there a, is so the kind of service discovery that, that occurs here is quite different to the kind of service discovery that kind of occurs here and, 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 and here. These, these microservices um, are, do um, so remember what we're doing is we're building an app. So um, what we're trying to do here is to find the particular instance, the particular IP address or DNS name that I want to connect to today um, for that service, and um, in which you know, in whichever data center it is. So it's, it's enabling us to do service discovery where we're scaling out scaling out a particular service, perhaps across multiple data centers, and, 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 and moving it around dynamically. So it's very much um, service discovery at runtime. Um, for the purposes of dynamic scaling and dynamic update. The, the kind of service discovery that occurs you know, on, this, on this event gateway is, a, is, a, is, is more a human being um, you know, discovering that there is a service that they can use and coding to it. Um, you know, I guess you know, service-oriented architecture had the concept of, 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 kind of automated service discovery and brokering, and there are people that are using that. Um, but it's not something that I get called upon to talk about very much. It's not. It's not the real focus anymore. It's I, I think it's actually not just do that. I mean, when we compose our microservices, yeah, we actually have microservices calling microservices calling. Microservices. Oh yeah. Yeah. So it's not just 
the right external, internal, yeah, actually, it's right. So, Kafka, so, for example, I mean, it's bus based architecture, a right. up in the middle, or whatever. So, what I'm trying to describe here is that obviously, here we've got many microservices calling each other. Um, but typically, what we find is we don't, in, in a microservice architecture, we tend not to put a gateway or any governance between microservices. So what, 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 we've, what I'm seeing is that um, the microservices just call each other, but we don't really put governance or, or gateways between them. But what we do do is put gateways between the, the, kind of the, the low-level system APIs and, and, and the microservice architecture. Is that, I mean, I'd be interested to understand, do, do, are you seeing kind of governance and, and gateways between microservices? Yeah, okay. Uh, but, That's interesting. Yeah, especially for the more enterprise based stuff. So you still need to maintain your security, you still need to maintain right. your encryption address, encryption of motion, or all of those enterprise rules. Right. Although we built it using you know high performance communication. That's right. where uh, yeah. uh, Informatica UM or yeah. high speed pops up or whatever. Absolutely. But so you put governance against your Kafka? Well, Kafka is slightly easier because you can actually use Kafka. I can run a lot of microservices, they won't interfere with each other. Uh -huh. Because that's the, you know, Kafka can, can, can do yeah. that. But if, if they're more tightly coupled, like a high speed pubs, low latency pubs, uh -huh. you, need, you need some governance. Okay, interesting. So that, in my experience, that's, that, that's that's fairly rare. I've not I've not I've not, I've not come across many folks putting strong governance between microservices. I'd be, I'd be fascinated to talk to you about that afterwards. Okay, we're running out of time, so uh, let me uh, let, let me press forwards. Um, so obviously, you know, enterprises come in all sorts of different uh, shapes and sizes. Occasionally, I get to talk to either a department or an enterprise, which is you know either. It, Either a, a greenfield startup or, or a greenfield startup inside a you know inside a big enterprise, and they build their entire um, architecture using microservice architecture. That they build the entire app from the ground up. We've got a, a few customers like that. Um, I've got lots of customers who think that they are greenfield, but actually turn out to be. To be more like more like this. So, so a, lot of, a lot of them start out by thinking that they are building their entire application from microservices, um, and they have no need whatsoever to call out to um, to the kind of underlying system of record and transform them. But actually, as time goes on, they find out that you know all that data that they need to get to um, uh, is is not really available in the form that they need it, and we end up with a kind of traditional integration layer. Um, underneath the API event gateway, because you know, it turns out that um, uh, as much as they thought that they wanted to build a microservice that was going to go out and talk to Kix um, via um, via you know, something we have called TOS Connect, which which allows people to make you know, REST API calls directly into into CICS, which is a, um, is a, you know, as a, a, a an information system that's forty something years old. Jeff will probably tell me it's 50 years old. Um, 67. 67 is pretty close. No, no, 67 is the date. 67, okay. So, the date. so, so it's, it's pretty close to 650. Yeah, 650. So, I mean, we, yeah. yeah. We, what we find is that, that, that typically uh, where, where, you, uh, where you're building a microservice architecture, you probably don't want to pull directly down into that, into that layer. So, you typically want to have some kind of Transformation in there to give you a, a, you know, a nicer API that, that goes up into the microservice layer. Although people have been successful in calling direct. Um, so one of the other things that comes up, kind of another thought, is um, there's a lot of different kinds of integrations that, that occur in, in enterprises. Um, we, we find, um, yeah. Uh, if, you, if you characterize the business benefit of, of, uh, of, of integrations as you know, high or low, um, obviously if there's, a, if there's a low business benefit and there's a, a large amount of complexity, you're not going to do it. So the, the blue ones don't get implemented. 
or mostly don't get looked for in, implemented. Um, where there's a high degree of complexity, we, we end up using you know, enterprise integration. But as we go down the kind of the complexity and go down the business benefit, we find you know, individual lines of business using um, using tools. This comes back to the the uh, the, um, the concept I was talking earlier on about you know, simple tools for for lines of business folks. So you know, it may well be that somebody down here, and I'm a business user, can't get funding to uh, to implement the uh, the integration that they want to to implement using the kind of techniques, the enterprise integration techniques, that um, the you know, traditional enterprise integration techniques. And that's why we end up building simpler tools, which are much easier to use for the simpler, simpler problems that end up getting used by these uh, business users. Rob, let me just come back on that one, because yes. the implication of that slide is that some of the integrations are low business value. Yep. The long tail, whereas the ones you quoted early on in your talk, ones that are clearly very high business value. Yeah. Um, so how do you how do you resolve that parallel? So so, um, so these integrations are to the enterprise. They are they are um, they might be of you know moderately you know not not enormous you know fast business value. Um, but there's a large number of them, there's a long tail. The point is there's a long tail. So if you integrate over the long tail, you find out there's quite a lot of benefit, there's quite a lot of value there. But you can only extract that value if you can do it in a simple way. And, and, that's, and that's really the point. So, so I didn't make that point very well, so thank you for that. That makes perfect sense. Then what do you do when one of them comes up to be very high business value? Well, well then maybe you, you know, maybe it's fine the way it is. Or maybe you re-implement it on, a, on, a, on an enterprise integration. And have we actually seen that happen? Um, I mean, it's usually pretty hard, but yeah, we, we, we are I can't think of an of example. We are doing, doing a lot of desktop integration at, in, at the desktop application, like, like the Tableau's of this world, the BI of this world. It's actually getting very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. And you, you just yeah. send the, the application into where the data is and the aggregation yeah. at, at the desktop. Because presumably I mean, there's a performance implication in terms of the amount of integration you're doing. But, but it is actually highly efficient because you're not moving the data. Mm -hmm. You're sending the compute into where the data lives and you integrate the result set at the desktop. Right. So you're actually aggregating very, very efficiently. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the end user would pay for the cycles that, that do the integration. Yes. So just looking at time, we'll be going an hour. Um, what's the hard cut? Because I know the AGM is starting. Yeah. Is that what time is the AGM starting? The AGM starts once you finish. Oh, okay, so you just with this group. Yeah. Okay. okay. So just a couple more uh, interesting uh, points, I think, to, to make. So, so the next section of the, of the talk, um, I say it very briefly, um, kind of try and make this real to talk about. So what's IBM? Uh, we talked about a load of concepts, right? A load of kind of ideas. So what are we actually doing? What are the kind of products that we're building to address this? Um, which hopefully will make some of these things uh, concrete. So, you know, IBM talks about a hybrid integration platform, which means basically a bunch of integration tools that all work nicely together. Um, which have fit for user experiences. So one of the things as we go out and talk to our customers is um, we need the line of business user who has a who wants a simple tool to get a simple tool, and we need the the um, the professional integrator who wants a powerful tool to get a powerful tool, and we need them to be able to work together. So using shared assets. So more and more we're converging our our, our integration products together so that um, both those users and the guy in the middle can use integration products and they can interwork with each other. So the idea is that where a line of business user wants to do something and they, they can almost do it, there's a little tweak they need that, that maybe needs a more powerful integration tool, 
the two things will work together and, and solve the problem. Kind of sounds obvious, but it's actually quite hard to do in practice. Um, the, um, so that kind of, kind, of, kind of deals with these, these two. Um, Cloud-based platforms, so um, people want to have their operations uh, you know, centralized, a centralized uh, kind of hub, um, but then the actual runtime to do the integrations out across all of the different hybrid environments. So you might be running, you might be wanting to run some of your integration logic in Amazon Cloud Platform, some of it in Azure, some of it on-prem, and you want to manage it all together. So, so that's the kind of, you know, that, that's the, the, the architectural statement is, is it's managed as if it's one thing, but it's actually distributed out and running uh, in the right places. And the reason that's, one of the reasons why that's really important is the, uh, from a security and a data sovereignty point of view, certain data has to stay in certain places for, 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 for sovereignty reasons. But you still want to um, manage it as if it was one. Um, uh, and, and I say hybrid enabled, so um, you know, run the applications near the data apps and data for sovereignty reasons and make secure connections. So all these different point-to-point -point connections between various different environments will have to be secured um, and with, uh, with policy. So kind of, as we look at all the problems we talked about, these, this is the kind of, this is the, kind of, um, uh, this is the, the message that we hear from our customers about what they want and this message we reflect back in what we're building. Um, in, in IBM to address the, the problems that we just described. Um, so, you know, just mapping uh, the, to the product. So, IBM has a, a platform as a service layer, which we call Bloomings. Um, it's designed to make it really, really easy for people to build microservice architectures. Uh, it's, it's got a number of technologies within it. It's got um, Power Foundry, um, which, which is an open source project that originated from uh, Pivotal. Um, it's also got um, uh, Docker containers within it, and it's got a whole bunch of services, like for example Kafka. So one of my teams actually runs a, a hosted Kafka message bus, um, <coughs> NoSQL databases, analytics, loads of the kind of Watson analytics uh, services are in there. And the point is, it makes it easy for you to build these applications fast. So Bloomings does that. Bloomings is actually pushing down into the kind of into the system of record as well now, uh, in that um, many of our customers are actually taking their on-premise um, uh, enterprise products and running them, you know, within Bloomix, so what we call lift and shift. So you know, taking things out of the data center and running them in the cloud. Um, so that, that's that's Bluemix. Um, uh, we have, as I said earlier on, we have API Connect. We have a, a a, a product that, that, that sits here and does the event gateway and the, and the API gateway and all the management, um, so API management products, so that's there and there. Um, and then we have um, the ability to run Node.js for all various different runtimes within Bluemix. Um, uh, and and uh, you know, obviously we have Webster Application Server Liberty. Um, and then for the integration, um, we have a product called App Connect, which I've got a couple of slides on in a minute. Um, up at this layer, we have IBM uh, Integration Bus, uh, which has a very long heritage going back through um, uh, through, through uh, um, uh, Message Broker, and before that to uh, MQSI, which one of the demo in the audience was, was actually the, 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 the follow of. Uh, so, uh, so that you know, that has a long history, and then we have you know, products like MQ um, and ZOS Connect down at, at the lower level. Um, so one of the, I just want to, one thing that I haven't mentioned yet is, is, or I haven't kind of made real, is this kind of concept of integration, I know many of you probably know, or some of you know our products, this concept of integration products that, um, that make sense for kind of non-technical users um, is, is a kind of a new concept for IBM. Um, so we're building, or we have built uh, a product that, that does that, um, and it's designed to be to be used by you know, a non-technical marketing person, um, and to be you know really, really, really simple. So it has intelligent connectors for all of the you know, many of the, the well-known uh, software as a service applications that that understand in minute detail 
the data formats and how you how you connect to that application, so that you can you know essentially just you know choose an app. I want to connect between uh, Salesforce. Um, what do I want to do from Salesforce? You know, when a new contact is created, I literally just click. When a new contact is created, I want to create a uh, new lead in Marketo. Yeah. So it's literally just as simple as, when this happens, I want to do this. So it's very much like if this and that, but it's applied to the business, business domain. Um, and then it has the ability to do you know, very simple mapping um, between the fields you know, of the source application and the fields of the target application in a way that a non-technical user can just go, oh yeah, I'm going to map from that name to that name. And actually, you know, we, in general, we normally just do that automatically for you. So there's a kind of auto mapper. Um, yeah. So and, and then there's the ability to add in transformations. So you know, just kind of finish up on the integration. Obviously, can be a very complex thing, but um, you know, more and more, we're, making, we're finding we, you know, ways to make it to make it simple for the uh, for the non technical user. So that was always going to. So lots of really super questions during the presentation, but uh, any other thoughts or comments or heckles, disagreements? They're the best ones. I learn from that. Um, perhaps following from something we were discussing, um, with so many different microservices going on. You mentioned in your experience that perhaps there are not many control between them, mm -hmm. more free flowing, you do that picking, cherry picking, and doing whatever. Yeah. Where were the kinds of controls or gateways put? Is it between the microservices and the um, between the digital, what the digital teams are doing and what the um, enterprise IT is? Or do you have it also within the microservices, depending on what kinds of code you're working with? Well, my experience is we 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 control everywhere. I mean, it's not it's not whether your legacy the, the slow guys or the fast guys. Okay. Same same control still exists, unfortunately. But I, I work for a bank, so because <laughs> because if you have so much pick and choose, it sounds like this sounds like a wealth of vulnerabilities holes coming. But, but a lot of the messaging architecture, like Kafka, for example, will allow a piece of data to be replicated reliably everywhere. Mm -hmm. So you can actually experiment. So one, one service going down doesn't really matter because you've got five of them doing the same thing. You can implement it five each contain so that yeah, they, because they are always, don't get cascaded. It's, it's, it's very stateless. I mean, the, the theoretical uh, basis that we do these things is borrowed from CR whole communicating sequential services, CSP. Um, and you use that sort of paradigm to design your system. He is actually fairly safe. Yeah. yeah. So, so in in some of the companies I'm yeah talking to, they haven't got the degree of they've chosen not to have the degree of rigor that you're discussing. Um, uh, they literally say to you know a team you know, they get a you know, a team of maybe five or six um, uh, engineers and they uh, and they will build one set one microservice and they will do it however they want. Well, whatever technology they want to use, they are tasked with getting that microservice done. And another team will write their microservice. What matters is the contract between them. So, uh, and then they exchange contract tests to police the uh, the contract. Right? So each each one runs the other person's test to make sure they don't have any. And then, but other than that, there's no there's no other, there's no governance at all. Other than you better pass my contract test. Um, it's a, yeah, it's another another way of doing it. Um, yeah, they, they, they each each approach has has its um, has its properties. So, how would you characterize the security and resilience questions versus the type of industry? So, I see microservice architectures in every every industry, and and, and, sure. and, and the kind of the wild west. But we just heard that banks, banks are yeah. pretty strict about the way they, they do things. So what about some other So, so um, <laughs> in my banking customers who are doing this, um, they are strict, but they're strict about what data can flow where. Um, so um, you know, we'll, we'll police what data can come into the system and then and then and then we'll know you know, the data yeah, that it's 
the application kind of has a boundary around it. Within that application, um, the, the, yeah, it, there's no real need for governance within that application. Obviously, uh, and again, yeah, around security, there's a, yeah, a, there's a very, I mean, so, so security is a, 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 a massive yeah, topic sure. in its own right. There's a you know, very, very large number of things that we need to do to ensure security, um, ranging you know, all the way from you know, you know, code inspection and, uh, yeah. to you know, network inspection to, you know, to people. And, you know, so so uh, security is kind of a cross-cutting concern. I, I'm not sure that... But, you know, forgive me for following up on that. The, I mean, you mentioned the Wild West. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you can give us an example of that. Uh, so, well, yeah, I can actually. I mean, so, so security, it's a wild west, but, but, but security really matters, even in, in the wild west. So, in for example, yeah, go on. Yeah, um, my team, but my team is building a microservice architecture. We're using Node.js. Um, uh, we, we have a private Node.js repository, and we don't pull our packages from the public Node.js repositories, because if we did, they could, they could pull in um, vulnerabilities that we don't know. So we, we have a private repository. So we still use all of the wonderful techniques of Node.js, we still use the packet managers, but, but we police the packages that we actually use. And we, we only use the ones that we know are safe. And no developer can actually use with a package from the public internet because they have to come from our private, private repository. So, so that's a kind of an example of, of how we get the agility that you get from a microservice architecture and those techniques, but whilst addressing back, you know, the concern of what happens if Node.js packages come in and, and they've been infected. Um, but, must, but that's just one of a, of a thousand things we do for security. Right, but there, there must be, you know, across the industries, there must be places where the, the, these uh, digital enthusiasts that you're talking about just pull stuff off the internet and do what they yeah. have like. And, and where do you see that happening? Uh, so, so um, consumer. Yeah, you know, I mean, it depends on what the, what the company is. We, 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 we do these things, even though yeah. we're so secure within ourselves. But you can still apply lots of architecture principles, like like all the data masking, client masking, yeah, and things like that. So, so inside inside the firm. I'm okay. sure you're right, Tony, but you know about those things, and the point is there must be a lot of people who don't. <laughs> yeah, right. and, and, and as we know, there are an awful lot of security uh, breaches uh, that occur. Uh, secu I mean, so security, you know, it, I think in a microservice architecture, you've got security issues you need to think about, big ones. And, and I think, you, but you have, you know, uh, I think security is a cross cutting concern, okay. even if you're in a monolith. You've still got you know, probably almost the same number of security concerns um, that you have to, to deal with um, these days. Uh, I spend so you know as chief architect of our product, I spend probably at least thirty percent of my time worrying about. And I've got I've got a security architect, and yet I still spend thirty percent of my time worrying about security. Um, uh, and I, I don't you know, I don't work for a bank, but but um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a it's an ever present uh, issue. How do you publish the the APIs for the gateway to the citizen developers? How, how do you how do you document? How do you, how do you let them know what they can do? What so can do? so um, so we have a product called uh, used to be called API Management, now called API Connect. Um, um, what this product does is um, uh, it, it uh, well, there's lots of things, but one of the things it does is it allows you to document an API using um, a format called Swagger. Um, which is, a, which is a, 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 a way of documenting APIs. And then we have a developer portal that um, you know, it, 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 the product implements a developer portal. Or in fact, you can have many developer portals if you want. And we have the ability to publish an API into that portal. And then, um, so if I'm, if I'm the producer of an API, I publish that API into the portal. And then consumers, you know, your, your customers come in and they and they say well, they, they discover the APIs and they read the documentation and they you know, maybe play with them and they say well I'd like to sign up to, to use that API and then they get security credentials and then um, you know, our customers can then monetize that API if they want to they can they can they can you know, charge people for using them should they want to they can run analytics on them so you know it's a whole product we have a product that does that there are I won't mention the names but there's there's lots of other companies in that market there's, there's probably a dozen companies in the market of building 
API management solutions. It's a very, it's a, you know, it's a big market. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hot market at the moment because it's so critical to, to the API economy to, and to digital transformation. And some, some of our uh, we're looking at lots of SaaS, SaaS providers mm -hmm. to buy applications from, and they seem to have their own messaging protocols. Uh -huh. And we need to wire up our buses with our messaging protocols with theirs. Right. How, how do you do that? How do you approach that? Uh, so I would tell you, uh, IBM Integration Bus to do that. Right. Um, so so uh, <laughs> I'm being flippant, but I mean so so. Um, that they you know, IBM has, and I know, you know, plenty of other com companies have too. Ours is the best, by the way. Um, so we have, uh, we have integration. I think, yeah, come on. <laughs> uh, we, we, there are you know, products that, that, you know, so IBM Integration Bus has clients for all the key, the key messaging protocols, and it can pull in a message, um, transform it, you know, do it, do it in the you know, right way, transaction, etc. Transform the contents of that message into what, you know, whatever way you want, and then send the message out. Um, to, to, the, to the other end, so that's you know, one, of the, one of the products that, that... I didn't want to make this into a product pitch, but yeah, we have, we have products that do that, and, and do that for you know, all, the, all the magic. Keep going, okay. yeah. so, so there's a question at the back? Or yeah. Okay. You're asking? Okay. Part, I, I'm not sure if it's trying to um, address some of your concerns, but I think one of your concerns, do you have clients, and if so, do you work with um, uh, enterprises that deal with critical infrastructure that have safety critical systems. So nuclear power plants, is this what you're trying yeah. to get at? No, it wasn't. Oh, okay. Right. 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 That's, um, that's a good question. I, our products are not rated uh, for use in safety critical. I mean, so, so the products I work on are not rated for use in safety critical situations. Okay. However, I do work with, uh, there are, I work, I work with um, several railways who, who use our integration products, and they manage to um, they manage to use them in situations. I mean, it's down the safety critical thing. They know it's not safety critical, yeah, but, but making it safety critical safe is down to them. Um, so, you know, integration products like ours are used in um, in, in in systems that you might, you know, that, So, I'll try and be clear about what I'm saying. Um, they, there are companies that find ways to use commercial, off-the-shelf integration products in situations that you might consider that they, where they wouldn't have to be safety critical, but they find a way to make them not. So they've got some other system that, that, can, that, can, that can deal with that. And I, I, don't, I don't know the details, but yeah, in general, no, not safety critical. Just, just going back very briefly to the question of the, the two views of how much you protect the microservices and sort of wrappers you put around them or whatever. Yeah. And the question of whether the difference between the two approaches might tie in with the difference in the, the companies involved, mm -hmm. not the company businesses. I'm just wondering whether there's a difference in the sorts of things that you allow your Microsoft microservices to do. Mm -hmm. And that, that in your two models, whether there's a difference that Maybe by maybe not protecting them, there's a bit of care in in, mm -hmm. in not allowing them to get certain access to the infrastructure underneath that would allow them yeah. to cause drastic damage. Whereas if you're putting more protection around them, Absolutely. maybe you can yeah. let them do a bit more. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, depending on what what the service is doing and the danger it, it, it presents, you might decide you need more architecture or really. So yeah. yeah. In, in your your view of it, you, you might be able to allow your microservices to do a bit more, independent of what sort of um, company you're working in. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing, uh, so in many, in many, many times we come across companies where the, the, the line of business is so focused on speed that, and, and uh, execution that um, they do things that are kind of crazy. Um, but, but, but you know, you think about what's happening. I mean, you know, I started out with the conversation with, if you were a taxi company five years ago, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have known that you were about to be put out of business by a bunch of geeks in California building a, a technology platform called Uber, right? You, you, this is real. I mean, this is the future of many of our key, you know, companies. They won't, they won't be around in five years' time if they don't transform for digital, right? It, it's happening. Um, 
and, and, the, and the CEOs and the CTOs get that. And, 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 and so there's, you know, this is this kind of, this was all, you know, you've got, the, you've got the, the, the IT folks kind of saying, you don't understand, we can't give you access to that. If we give you access to that, well, 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 bad stuff will happen. And then you've got the CTO going, well, but if we don't build this application, we're going out of business. And the thing is, they're both right. That's, that's the thing, they're both right. So hence the kind of the architecture around well, how do you get the how do you get how do you get the two together? And, and Amazon are now beginning to launch the um, on-site bricks and mortar yeah. uh, places. This was released on the news last night. Mm -hmm. So they're moving now to bricks and mortar. Yeah. Interesting. So maybe yeah. there's a pendulum swing. Yeah. Yeah, but like I said, fascinating time to be a geek. That's all I can say. So. <laughs> So, so, so the famous um, integration of YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook would be implementable by by your integration techniques. Uh, I, yeah, I, th I think I think yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they, they could those companies could choose to use IBM technology, and we'd be very happy to, 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 to sell it to them. The uh, well, well known new Twitch face. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any more? Thank you very much. Thank you.